What's up, everybody? Michael Silva here. Welcome back to the Figuring Out Money channel, where we dissect the intricate world of finance through the lens of technical and intermarket analysis. Today's episode is packed with insights you won't want to miss. Over an 80-page deck coming at you. We've got a lot on our plate today, from the broad markets contracting on bigger timeframes to the sensational surge in gold prices, even as the dollar flexes its muscles. And let's not forget about those adrenaline-pumping moves in the VIX as traders scrambled for protection. But it doesn't end there. We'll also be delving deep into the current economic backdrop, unraveling the mysteries of what's driving the financial world right now. So if you're ready to chart this course through these turbulent waters, buckle up because we're about to embark on a journey of financial discovery. Let's get into it. Welcome back, everybody, to the show. There will be timestamps in the description for anybody that'd like to skip around. Just note that you may miss out on some critical information. If you want this 80-page chart deck in PDF form, you can get it for free in the pinned link in the description, as well as the comment. You'll see my partner there, Interactive Brokers, and you'll have access to the link where I have my swing trading community. Let's go ahead and get into the state of the economy. I want to start off here looking at Marty's web investment rules. The reason why I want to show this is because there's two rules in here that are very important and they're in very critical order. The number one is the trend is your friend. Don't fight the tape. What this means is if the market's moving up, don't be trying to short it. If the market's moving down and it's moving down aggressively, be very careful, especially if the trend remains to the downside. The sixth number over here is don't fight the Fed, but it has in parentheses that it is less valid than number one. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up now is because we're going to be going into the state of the economy, talking about what the Fed is currently doing, and it is butting heads with number one, which is the trend. So we're going to really kind of dive deep into what's going on from the economic standpoint, but then map out key levels throughout this show to really give you a good idea of how to manage risk through these turbulent waters. Now, I want to start off here. Looking at the balance sheet, the Fed is reducing the balance sheet. So in simple terms, the Fed is tightening right now. We saw a spike right over here. And what was that? That was when the banking crisis took place. Okay, we saw that spike up. The bank term funding program came out, added some liquidity, and then boom, we're still on the path to tighten. And you can see that also here looking at the federal funds effective rate. We can see we saw a rapid rise in rates, which we're all well aware of to what? To fight inflation. Now the question is, are we going to be holding them here for longer? Are we going to be raising or are we going to be bringing them down? All of which have their own repercussions. Now, if we take a look at the Fed watch tool looking out to November, there is a 91.7% probability that the rates will remain where they currently are. Okay. If I look out further out in that curve, you'll see that actually we see a rate cut, but it's way back here in June of 2024. So we'll see as time progresses if this changes even more or if we're going to be holding them even higher. Uh, you know, say Jerome Powell wants to really stick to his word to fight inflation. Now we had producer price inflation month over month come out. That came in hotter than expected. The consensus was 0.3, came in at 0.5, although it was slightly lower than the prior uh, recording the United States inflation rate remains elevated at 3.7, which was above the consensus. Now, core inflation, the Fed's goal is to get it to 2%, but you can see it is dropping. But if you look at a 25 year chart, it still remains heavily elevated. Now, the core inflation, it doesn't include things that me and you we use all the time, right? So, food, energy. And, and those type of volatile items is not included in this, which is why you see this one beating consensus because the rise in energy prices. Right here is looking at, in short, you, it's loans and leases and bank credit. So think of this as credit growth. So when it, when it moves up, credit is not contracting. When it moves down, credit growth is contracting. And this is looking at a year over year perspective. And I wanted to point this out because we're dating back to 1975 to where we are now. And you'll see these gray shaded areas and leading up to the gray shaded areas, you do see credit growth contracting. So one could say, hey, every time we saw credit growth, every time we had a recession, what preceded that what was before that was credit growth contracting. But every time credit growth contracted didn't mean that there was necessarily a recession. So I wanted to add another element to this uh, because we are currently contracting when I look at all commercial banks, even if I were to break this into um, large and small, so like the small is the red, blue is the large, and you can see we're still contracting as it stands. So I wanted to add another element, and that element is the 10-year minus 2-year 
yield curve. And what you'll notice here is the yield curve, which is in red, when it is inverted below that black line, boom, when it's inverted below that black line, you can see as it starts to uninvert, or even when it gets into inversion and starts to uninvert, this is typically when you see that credit growth contracting. You can see, boom, it's starting to move out, credit growth is contracting. It has like these jaws, uninverting, credit growth contracting, okay? Uninverting, a little bit right here, right? And we're starting to obviously have credit growth contract here as well. And an inverted yield curve, which we'll show more in detail later, on various charts has been a good indicator of a recession to potentially come, but you don't really see the effects of higher rates and these uninversions or yield curve inverting for, it could be, you know, 12 to 18 months. There's all kinds of different time frames for it. Okay, if I keep moving forward, what you'll notice here is the 10 year, two year, which is in red, but then I just included the federal funds effective rate. And you'll notice that when we uninvert, boom, you see the gray shaded area recession. And then the Fed does something to bring rates down. We uninvert, recession, Fed brings rates down. We uninvert, recession not too far after, rates are brought down, okay? We saw a small inversion here. We uninverted, rates were brought down, okay? We're in, uh, in inverted territory right now and rates are still really high as the fed says we're going to be holding them here for higher for longer okay i want to also show you what this looks like next to the vix so you'll see the federal funds rate in blue and then the vix which is the volatility index you typically see when we meet some sort of market bottom or when rates are brought down to zero there is some sort of an event that takes place now i can't tell you what the next event may be or if it's even going to happen or how the Fed's going to navigate this. But you'll notice that when we start, start spiking over the 40 marker on the VIX, it has marked bottoms in the market in the past. And sometimes it even gets as high as 80 and potentially even higher. And you'll notice that when we have these big spikes, look at where rates go to shortly thereafter. Okay. This is only dating back to 2002 as it stands. Okay. If we continue on, I wanted to also show what the federal funds rate looks next to the Wilshire 5000 and where these gray shaded areas are, I'm just pointing out that typically when we go into recession, the market actually hasn't met its bottom yet. And we technically haven't gone in recession. Now, remember, these could be potentially backdated. We could very well be in a recession right now where the Fed comes out and says, well, we were in one and still maybe perhaps the market bottom's always in, already in. We don't know that for certain, but I did want to just point this out as we're currently, quote unquote, not in a recession I wanted to take another look at some interesting charts here. This is the net percentage of domestic banks. They're reporting stronger demand for commercial and industrial loans from large and large and middle cap and small firms. So basically think of this as, okay, or if the line's moving up, right? If the line's going up, boom, 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 there is a strong demand for commercial and industrial loans. All right, so that means people want loans, right? Banks or, or commercial like businesses, they want loans. And what you'll see here is we see this big drawdown here, which is at a lowest level that we haven't seen since really 2008. And prior to that was 2002, both for large, middle and small, small firms. So is demand strong right now for these loans? The answer is no, there's not a strong demand right now. And if you take a look at the tightening standards for commercial and industrial loans, we'll take a look here. Uh, you can see for large and small, they're both moving in unison and they're higher. So tightening standards are increasing. If we continue on, you can take a look at commercial bank interest rates on credit cards. Okay, this really drives into the consumer. You're seeing at basically a you know, decade plus, all right, this is dating back to 1995, high for interest rates on credit cards. So that puts pressure, obviously, on the consumer. And I'll tell you what else will put uh, pressure on the consumer here momentarily. But if we take a look at something like auto loans for 60 and 48 months, these levels haven't been seen since what? Well, prior to the great financial crisis. So we're seeing a very rapid rise in the cost of loans to, well, autos. Take a look at the 30-year mortgage rate. This thing continues to climb up higher. Look at 7.57% for the 30-year mortgage rate. You look back to the left of the screen and we haven't been here since the dot-com era. Now you'll notice that, hey, we're typically around in these areas, but remember house pricing has increased significantly. Now it's even more expensive that rates are higher. Okay, people are leveraging their credit cards, opening more accounts, bank deposits have been coming down a little bit. So there's obviously a lot of pressure building. And you can see that here looking at an article that was posted by Bloomberg, HELOC gains popularity as mortgage rates rise. So people are drawing out levels or HELOCs on their home 
boom. And even the article said that they're using all kinds of random things like uh, remodels. And then also I heard a partial of the article to say that they were investing some of it into the stock market, which could be very dangerous as a higher risk, right? So, but this is at a level that we haven't seen since 2008. Another you know, interesting chart that I found on Twitter by Kurt. He pointed out that there's a hardship withdrawal, a highest level that we really haven't seen. Just looking back to the left, he provided till 2013. So we're seeing a large increase in people withdrawing from their 401ks. And this is all happening on the backdrop of 30 plus day delinquencies increasing in both auto loans and credit cards. You're starting to see these rise up pretty significantly to levels that we haven't really seen in quite some time. Notice student loan, right? This is big kind of flat here, and I'll explain more into that a little bit later. You're starting to see a little bit of an uptick in mortgages. Now, if we draw this out to 90 plus day delinquencies, these are considered the serious delinquencies. So this is a, you have a credit card and you're like, dude, and you haven't made a payment for 90 plus days kind of given up on it. And these levels, right? They haven't seen this since 2020, but then even back to that, we haven't been to these levels for quite some time as well. And you're starting to see a little bit of an uptick there in auto loans. Now, the reason why I brought up student loans is because, well, guess what? Student loan borrows hit snags as payments resume. Okay, so it's gonna be a challenging environment. What could make these things increase or shoot off even more as people are using their credit cards and people are becoming delinquent? Well, obviously, student loans. And you might be seeing this right now in US Consumer Credit Month over Month. You see a drop over here in usage. So is are we already seeing the effects of student loans payments resuming? You may have seen this chart on Twitter. This is the federal deficit. It's even bigger than it potentially looks, but huge deficit. And the reason why they're saying that it looks you know, even bigger than it, it could be even bigger than it looks is because there was a lot of altercations when it comes to these student loans. If you take a look at the federal debt held by, held by the public, obviously a just parabolic rise here and the government costs have been increasing too as rates have been going higher, making the interest payments on this federal debt from a quarterly perspective, literally go parabolic, okay? So it's just overall, the way that I see this going on, you can do, you can take it a couple of ways, right? You can think outside of your own house, right? And start thinking about the economy and everything, or you can start getting your home in order. And that's what I've been really preaching on this channel from to bringing it from a very macro to a micro view, all right? If you are, you know, building up credit card debts. If you do take out HELOCs and if you're doing all this stuff, you're going to really have to think of ways to reduce the risk under your own roof. So if something does happen, you are more protected. You need an emergency fund and focus on the four walls around you. That's how you can withstand anything that may happen in the future. Now, we talked about student loans potentially rising, which can add obviously pressure to all of these data points, but also one of the bigger ones is unemployment. That's the most lagging effect. So as we're raising rates, right, if unemployment starts to rise, all this can amplify even more. All right, we're going to get into the weekly performance now, everybody weekly performance. A couple of things to call out, right? We didn't really have a bad week, right? There was a lot of volatility, but the S&P 500 finished up. Q's finished flat. IWM, right? That finished down pretty significantly. So that's a little bit of a red flag. So we might have had, you know, because the 10-year yield dropped a little bit, it offered up a little bit of relief as it stands currently, right? The dollar was up very slightly too, but nonetheless, it was up. Now, a big move, which we'll talk about later, was gold, right? That last day of the week, it's up 5.38%, which is a monster move, including in an area where the dollar ended up being up for the week too, and miners were up. And remember, if you go back to my prior episodes, as miners have been getting hit, we talked about the bullish percent index, and I'll show you that because those things were looking primed for a potential bounce, and we definitely got it. What's on deck for next week? We got earnings, and earnings bring on volatility, right? A couple of big names here we got. We got some banks still, like Charles Schwab. We got Tesla reporting on Wednesday, Netflix, and many others. If you wanna screenshot this or go to their Twitter account so you can get these charts yourself, please make sure you do so. Going into next week, as far as macro data drops, we get retail sales is a big one, building permits, and then we also have on Thursday, Fed Chair Powell. We have a couple other two-star rated as far as importance goes there too as well, but I'm not gonna dig too much into that. If you want this chart, like I said, just download the chart deck for free. Let's get into volatility. This is where a lot of things really took place, which could create, obviously, a very explosive environment coming into this next week, right? We saw a huge move in the VIX. Now, I'm not gonna talk about 
too much as far as the move, like why was it so explosive? And then the markets didn't really go down. I want you to just be aware that, you know, where the level is at, right? So it's at 19.32%. Okay, this is telling us, it doesn't give us like a directional bias. Hey, the market's gonna go up or down. It means the market is going to have potentially larger swings. And I can show you that here via this chart, right? So if you come down here to level 19, right? The VIX is at about 19 to 20. And you look at the daily time frame when you do the calculation, it's basically telling us where the VIX lies right now. It's giving us an implied move of about 1.2 to 1.26%. And that could be to the upside or to the downside. Now, the reason why we said, you know, reaching potential for protection, you can see the a volatility of volatility also shot off like a rocket ship there too, heading into this weekend. Okay, if you take a look at the futures curve, so VIX futures, uh, the, 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 the curve, you'll see here that we are moving into a period of backwardation. And basically in very short terms, I want you to think of this very simply, right? So typically the curve will look like this, right? So you're here and you look out into the future and you're like, yeah, there can be more risks into the future. Okay. But in your current state, you know, everything's fine and everything's good. That's what it looks like. But when you have the current state, looking into November to December, when it's above it, it's basically telling us, hey, there's more risk right now in the markets than there is into the next month. So we need to protect ourselves right now. That's how I interpret this specific chart. And to give you even more context, I wanna just show you the weekly expected moves. This is something that I share with my Discord community. This was last week. And I want you to just call, look at this SPX. It was at $76 move. The SPY was a $7. Q's was an $8 expected move. Okay. And typically like on individual names, when you go into earnings, so we'll say Netflix and Tesla, pay attention to those 12 and 13. When you go into earnings, think of it as like a blowfish, right? As you move closer to the earnings date, implied volatility swells like a puffer fish, like a big blowfish, and it expands, allowing for more you know, risk to potentially enter into the equity. Okay, but just take a look here. As we went into backwardation, as the VIX fired off and the volatility of volatility, when I update you with these expected moves, the SPX is an $86 expected move going into this next week. The SPY is a $9. Netflix does have earnings. It's swelled up to $30, right? That's coming from 13, so obviously big. Uh, Tesla was a 12 and it moved up to 18, so a large move. And these are big market cap names. Well, Tesla is one of the larger market cap names that really can control potential order flow uh, into the market. NVIDIA is $20 expected move, and that's coming from 17, so even that swelled up. If you want these levels, you can screenshot this or download the chart deck, and you could put these levels on your screen. So, you know, I always put these on our chart, and I'll show you how the S&P 500 fared on the last prior week. And we'll get into the S&P 500 right now. I want to start first looking at a quarterly chart. And I only wanted to call this out because I've called it out before, but I want to give you more broader context. We are above a rising to flattening, right? Rising, I'd say a five period EMA. So that's positive note, right? So it's not, that's not bearish. However, there was a bearish crossover on the price momentum oscillator. This usually utilizes the rate of change. And I like using this on a bigger time frame because it's, it's very rare that you see crossovers. It can take years. Okay. But we had a bearish crossover and the last time we had a crossover, it was a bullish one. And that was back in 2012. Now, when do we else have bearish crossovers? We had a bearish crossover right here in 2007 to 2008. And then the last time prior to that was in 2000, going into 2001. And those both led to some more sell side activity. That doesn't necessarily mean that that is a given and we're going to start breaking. However, if we start getting underneath that five EMA, which is, you know, four, two, three, four, if we close beneath there for the quarter and take out the prior low quarter, the uh, the low of the prior quarter, that could spell out more downside for these overall markets. If we take a look at the weekly time frame, we are below that declining 5 EMA, but we did try to get back above it, but the markets pushed it back down. Uh, however, like I said, we did finish positive for the month and we closed above the high of the prior weekly candle and then obviously right around this candle too. So you get these, you know, long lower wicks, all right? And then we saw an explosive move. So that's not that bad. Now, if we start recapturing the 5 EMA, boom, and we start closing above it, we could very well try to go take another shot back at this big area of resistance up ahead. I know that there are some key levels and those key levels can be 
gamma exposure levels, which we'll talk about right now, the SPX. Now, gamma exposure levels, these are important because this can give you insight on how dealers have to reposition into and around these levels, okay? So I have, I'm using spot gamma exposure. So when I look at this, the red, when price is above it, it can act as a potential area of resistance. If the green is above it, if price starts getting above it, dealers will have to buy into that, which we can see a more forceful move to the upside. The blue lines is the daily expected move, which we just, uh, well, we went over the weekly expected move, but these are the daily expected moves going into Monday, okay? And then we have the orange ones, and those are the weekly expected moves, which we just went over. I also included gamma flip levels, so this is basically telling us Okay, that you know, if this is across all expirations and being that we're down way here and the big gamma flip level is at 4540, this is just telling us that we're in a more volatile environment. We can see larger swings to the upside, larger swings to the downside as price is below that. And the reason is is because as price moves up, dealers are buying into it, and as price moves down, dealers are selling into it, creating more volatility. Now we're above the next expiration, gamma flip level. So what that tells me is as price moves down, we're looking to buy the dips, okay? But if we start getting underneath that, be careful because we can break away with some heavy volume down to the lower daily, potentially down to the lower weekly. So in the short term, we're looking to buy the dip, okay, on the daily chart as we saw this explosive move, momentum slowed, we warned it, boom, we cracked lower, okay? But we're still above this current expiration, all right? If we continue on, I wanted to just point out the SPY 15 minute time frame. Look at the weekly expected move and how price action right in confluence with it. I had a lot of people say it wasn't the weekly expected move, it was the bond auction, right? And I just, I laugh because yeah, there's always going to be a catalyst, but how do you interpret the markets and get ready before the catalyst hits? You need to look at things from a broad perspective. Would you go along right here knowing that this was the upper weekly expected move and what the market price is as far as risks using billions of dollars? The answer would probably be no, not really, okay? But then also, as price was moving up, what was going on that specific day too? Well, yields were rising rapidly. The dollar was rising rapidly on the macro reports, okay? So it gave us insight, and then we had a catalyst that dropped the market, okay? If you didn't know that, you come in late, you didn't make a trade, you weren't prepared, and then you say, oh, it was the bond auction. Yeah, no duh. There's always going to be a catalyst, Okay, so that held as a level, and guess what? 68% of the time, right? If you think of it in terms of statistical probabilities, it closes in within one standard deviation, and it closed within that uh, weekly expected move. The daily expected move, which we went over on the prior episode, look at how it came into it. We bounced up, came into it, bounced up. But I want to call out here on the updated of what's taking place from a structural standpoint. Now, the week to date, we finished below it, which tells me that the average person based off of volume for the week was underwater, okay? So yes, we finished up for the week, but the average buyer based off of volume finished down on the SPY. Another note is we're below the five-day moving average. You can see we broke down from it, held as resistance, came back down, and now we're trading below it. So for me personally, this right here is bearish, but as it's still trending up, it's with caution. So I don't just short into this. Okay, I personally like trading from the long side, so I want to see price back above this week to date anchored VWAP. Now, we're going to get a new one on Monday, but that is what I would like to see as prices start building itself back up. But if we stay below it, price comes up, maybe it tricks out, does something like that, and we break down further, or if it doesn't hold and it holds and it breaks down further, start looking at the quarter to date anchored VWAP because that is still inclining, but then also the lower daily and then we have over here. Now I have the two standard deviation moves. So if we just have a wild move come out next uh, on Monday, the standard devi the two standard deviation move lines up with the weekly expected move there. So just be ready because these are large moves in a short period of time uh, given the context of what's taking place in volatility land. Let's take a look at bonds and yields. So the TNX, the TNX finished slightly down on the last trading day, but the day prior to that, we saw a big, strong move, okay? It's still within this upward channel. And the reason why I wanna show you this and I you know, keep on hounding on the 10-year yield and even the dollar is because these intermarket assets, they hold weight on the financial markets. If you start seeing the yields rise rapidly, this puts pressure on growth stocks, right? Rates, more expensive, heavy debt names, 
you know, the debt becomes more expensive to burden, right? Sometimes if the 10 year yield rises, the oil will prices will rise alongside of it. And we've pointed out many times that strong leadership in energy stocks is not good for the overall stock market. Okay. So as we stand right now, we're still in a bull channel after this breakout. And until we start breaking back down, it may offer up relief. Okay, but we got to talk about it when it gets there because the possibility for a flight to safety is also an option and the flight to safety could be something like the TLT whereas if we see an explosive move to the upside, you know, that could be actually dangerous for the markets. And I, I say this because we, we mentioned a couple of commodities like gold and the dollar moving hand in hand too. Now, if we take a look at the 10-year two-year yield curve down here in the 10-year three-month. We're still well in inverted territory. And you can see they came down a little bit. That offers up some relief to the markets, right? Ever since we moved into inversion on the yield curve, the 10 and 2, it drops further into inversion. The S&P 500 rised. Drops further, it rise. Drop further, it rose. Drop further, it rose. However, when we start rising, what I've noticed is, well, the market is obviously selling off. So if this comes down, maybe that offers up still more relief in the overall market. But remember, at some point, this yield curve will have to uninvert, and that could be potentially bad for the markets. And you can see that here, right? If you look at the 10-year, two-year, as we uninverted here in 2000, as we inverted here in 2008, as we inverted here in 2020, and we're well inverted right now, but you can see we uninverted, rates came down, VIX shot up. Rates came down, VIX shot up, rates came down, rates came down, VIX shot up. And you can see that we saw, obviously, a lot of turbulence in the financial markets. So I can't tell you if this is gonna play out the same, but what I can tell you is that risk is elevated. So you just need to be aware that there's risks given the current economic conditions and technical and intermarket perspectives as well. You can also see this here in the IWM weekly chart. And I like looking at small caps because small caps can be a leading indicator. Okay, I've seen plenty of times, if you look at the IWM alongside the Dow Jones Industrial Average, you'll see that when IWM puts in a lower high, but the Dow Jones Industrial puts in a higher high, those divergences can play out giving us insight that saying, hey, the Dow Jones may be heading down soon. And, you know, I have prior videos where I really delve deep into that. So you'd have to kind of dig through the channel or ask me in the comments and I'll try to, I'll, I'll, I'll send the video or I'll comment back the video link, okay? Where I really dove into those charts. But I wanted to give more context here as far as the 10-year, two-year inversion, 10-year, two-year inversion, 10-year, two-year inversion. And then alongside the federal funds rate, and then the RVX, which is Russell Volatility. I recently shared this chart up on Twitter, but you can see that the best time to buy the small caps is when money's cheap. By money cheap, I mean when rates are smashed down, right? When money is inexp when it's not expensive, meaning that they can borrow more money at a lower cost in simple terms. But when you raise rates, Money is becoming more expensive. It puts pressure on the consumer. And we've already talked about higher interest rates. We talked about loans becoming more expensive. We talked about tightening standards. We talked about all of that. And you could see as rates moved up, right? As rates moved up, where did the volatility? The volatility came in. Rates moved up. We saw choppy, choppy volatility. Rates moved up. Boom, choppy, choppy volatility. Okay, but then when is a good time to potentially move rates down? Well, I can't tell you when the Fed might do that, but I can show you on this chart that look at the contraction of volatility in multiple times including right now, and then all of a sudden, right, we start moving rates down, but then there's this volatility event, which we previously discussed on the S&P 500 chart in the macro section, boom, you know, or the state of the economy section, boom, you see this explosive move in volatility, and then the Fed has forced its hand to do something about it, right? Boom, massive spike in volatility, an event, something occurred, rates were moved back down, right? We're compressing right now, the yield curve is inverted, we, we're going to uninvert at some point. Are we going to see a spike in volatility forcing the Fed to make a move and change the narrative of higher rates for longer? Once again, I don't have that answer. I'm not trying to predict it. What I'm showing you is a chart that's va valid data that's happened in the past and what's taking place right now, okay? So do it with it as you will, right? Let's hop into the dollar. The dollar had a nice strong move as we talked about gold moving alongside of that, but the dollar, right, as the dollar keeps on continuing to press higher, right, could be potentially act as a flight to safety. And this is putting pressure on the S&P 500. And we'll hop into the commodity section. The dollar was up and just take a look at that explosive move in gold. Holy moly, a 3% day to the upside is nothing to joke about. It came where? It came into that 1825 level of support that it prior, prior had. So we just had that explosive move while the dollar was up, while volatility is, you know, reaching for the skies is 
potential people reaching for protection. This to me seems like people are preparing themselves for a possibility of an event to occur, but that event hasn't actually taken place as it stands that really increases the volatility index, which shoves the market significantly down, at least as it stands right now. But people are reaching for protection, all right? Take a look at crude oil. The move in crude oil was also absolutely bonkers on the last trading day, 5.77% to the upside. This is a huge intermarket asset. And remember, rising spikes in oil, large moves in oil has contributed to basically every recession looking back. You can look at the dot-com, you can look at the financial crisis, all the way dating back to the oil embargo, right? That is what's absolutely bonkers. I've had some charts there too on my Twitter that show that you'd have to comment it or look around for it. Copper was also down for the fourth day in a row. We talked about that divergence while the market was up here and momentum slowing, right? We said we called it momentum slowing. Divergences are building. Copper is still down. And then this S&P 500 pulled back. So if this starts bouncing, perhaps that offers up some relief there in the S&P 500. Silver, right? Another huge day there, right? Alongside gold. And what I've been calling out is the strong correlation between silver and gold miners. Now, gold miners finished up about I think it was like four to six percent on the day. I can't quite remember the exact number, but they do move hand in hand. And the reason why I've been kind of talking about gold miners since they've been breaking down into these low levels is because when you look at something like the bullish percent index on the weekly time frame, we reached levels of 10. All right. And the last time we were here was right here going into October. And we talked about the positive divergence that was building in the RSI. OK, now price obviously has been pulling back. We saw, you know, one good day. That doesn't mean, you know, all is, you know, free or whatever. All, all is, you know, s- s- caution to the wind. But it is still playing. It's potentially playing out as it stands right now. Prior to that positive divergences, right? You had a negative divergence here, which marked that peak. So these extreme levels can be areas if you want to accumulate some, depending on your type of style of investing. I'll hop really quick into the Bitcoin chart. This is the sailor to shift indicator. This has been by far the most buy, the most, the best in my opinion, buy and sell signal for crypto. Bitcoin, Ethereum, various miners, and so forth. You know, right? When we, I'm not going to go too much into the indicator itself, but in the description, I have a video of this that shows you how you can use it, my current strategy behind it, and so forth. But the green lines are buy signals, the red are sell signals. It caught massive tops, it catches massive bottoms. We are on a recent buy signal, so we saw a little pop up higher, and price is actually pulling back right now, and this indicator is pulling back down. So I just wanted to call that out. Price is kind of whip sign around, and it has been whip sign around. And if you take a look at something like Ethereum, it is just hanging on here for dear life. So be very careful on a potential break here because a break, there's not much volume traded around this level. I mean, a 1500, but below that is 1350 where we had prior resistance and that turned into support as the 50 period EMA. And you look at the ratio between Ethereum and S&P 500 cross down, right? You see the weakness, but when it sometimes crosses up, boom through it, you can see some strength. So potentially watch our cross back up this to turn around, or if it's going to hold down here, we could still very well see some more sell side there. But I'd like to see, obviously, the trigger, uh, the signal flip, and then the official trigger of a sell side activity, which I'll talk about if it happens, but it's not there as it stands. We're going to go into some other stock market indicators, looking at some bullish percent indexes. You can see here the bullish percent index for the NASDAQ composite still remains in oversold territory. Okay, so that's one thing to note. We can see the financial sector is in oversold territory as we're starting to report earnings. The NYSE this is an oversold condition, so a lot of oversold conditions. Take a look here at the NASDAQ record high percent index. It has not reached down to the 20 level, but it is in a critical area because when we reach down to these low levels and it turns back up and crosses up through 35, David Knepner, I, I always pronounce his name wrong, has pointed out that that is when we see a strong breath and it's marked out bottoms, including all the way back down here. We saw that large move going into the dot-com bus. It marked the bottom of the dot-com bus. We saw a whipsaw over here, which moved a little higher, but then down. So you got to be careful. But it marked the bottom of the uh, financial crisis. It marked this bottom, that bottom, this bottom. So it is a powerful tool. It even marked most recently the bottom here going into 2023. So as markets are pulling down, breath is weakening. This is coming down. If this starts turning back up and breath re-enters the market, right, we start to see a record high percent index start to move up. 
and we get a breath thrust, maybe that might be a, pos a positive thing, obviously, for the markets to see a stronger up move. Now, if I look at the summation index on the NYSE, we haven't actually had a bullish crossover yet on the parabolic start, but it's not too far off as it stands. We had that positive divergence play off in the NASDAQ McClellan oscillator. If you look at the NASDAQ summation index, this did have a bullish crossover, but it's already starting to fish hook like it did over here. So it is bullish as it stands right now in that terms. As we played out this positive divergence, I will note that the NASDAQ McClellan oscillator crossed down below zero on Friday as it's putting in currently another lower high. So you'd really wanna see this high taken out and this to hold alongside you'd want to see this to flip positive too. Just more breath the merrier, okay? If we take a look over here at small cap versus large cap, or sorry, growth versus value, my apologies. Uh, and I'm looking at this rate of change of that. And then over here is just a chart of the Qs, okay? So I'm measuring the rate of change, the 10 day rate of change between growth and value. And what I've noticed is when the rate of change crosses down below zero, it has marked some moves to the downside. So for example, a big one was right here, crossed down through zero and the market sold off. All right, crossed down through zero, crossed down through zero, zero, zero. And you can see multiple times, the last time was right over here. And we call that out. We saw move to the downside. Then more recently, we crawled, talked about how it crossed back above it and how that could sometimes be bullish for the markets like there. And we saw this move higher. And well, as it stands, we moved up higher. Now we're starting to see a little bit of weakness. So if the rate of change between these two assets move cross down through zero, maybe that's telling us that there could be potentially more weakness. If you take a look over here, these are the safety ratios of S&P 500. So gold over S&P 500, utilities over S&P 500, consumer staples, right? Bonds, still flat rather, and healthcare. I just wanted to call out that we are starting to see utilities start to curl back up, but this is a very rate sensitive name. The big one, the big difference here was the change in tune on gold relative to the S&P 500 right there. So if the bonds start to uptick, start getting above that 50 EMA, that could spell more of a safety trade taking place. Whereas if I look at the big mega cap like Meta over SPY or SPX, Apple, Nvidia, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, Netflix, and Tesla, this these are heading down. So Netflix again beat up. We're starting to see a potential bearish crossover as we head into earnings there. Uh, Amazon's rather flat. As the 50 EMA is starting to kind of flatten out, we're also flat here in Microsoft. Google's been very positive. NVIDIA has been positive. S subtle turn down here, but nothing crazy. Meta backed off slightly, but that's in an uptrend. And then Apple too. So overall, I mean, it seems like we're, you know, a risk on, but it's for very few names. Now I want to hop into the chart of the week. The chart of the week is what, you know, where I started off in this intro and the thumbnail we're contracting on bigger time frames. And the best way to look at this is through the lens of this Bollinger Bands, right? This is volatility bands, bridge bands, of various different bands that you can look at. But I'm putting down here the Bollinger width. And the width of the Bollinger Bands, you can see as it moves down, you can see bands are contracting, bands are contracting, bands are contracting, bands are contracting. And a simple principle of technical analysis that we always mention is markets move between contraction and expansion okay so what this tells me here is it's likely as we're contracting to a level that we haven't seen since october since the prior october and well since the prior october surprisingly this was pulled out i did not call this out uh, so one of the twitter followers christy if you don't follow her you can follow her she posts a lot of charts and stuff too she noticed that it was always in October. So based off of seasonality, where we do typically see some strong seasonality sometimes, but also weak times. But what you notice here is you see volatility contracting in the months of October dating back to 2018. And you typically see explosive moves in the near future. And the reason why I'm calling that out now is because we are in an uptrend. As markets pulling back, putting in a lower high, a little bit of a shooting star candle, right? You can see the Bollinger Band coming down here and this one lifting up. So if we start taking out 13,000, maybe we start expanding, boom, to the downside. However, if we take out the high of this last week, boom, maybe perhaps we start expanding, but that plays out as somewhat of a bull flag and we try to go for that all-time high in the NASDAQ composite. I went over a lot today, people. Hope it helps out. Like I said, if you haven't downloaded the chart deck and you wanna relook at these charts, feel free to do so. Check out the Patreon, check out Interactive Brokers. That's all I got for you on today's episode. See you later.